Melvi Broadcasting Network, a divine voice out of Africa. Remember to like, to subscribe, and to click the bell. That tells you that they don't even understand the times in which they live. They want themselves at the center of things rather than Christ at the center of it. You understand what I'm saying? Probation has to close because every man has made a decision. God at some point has to say, I respect your decision. That is the consequence of sin. I'm, I'm making a case because there are people who don't think they need a savior. But I want to make the case that you need a savior because you not only are a sinner, you live in a world that has been destroyed by sin. We have all sinned. We are going to praise God. How different will our life be this year if when trial and tragedy comes, when difficulty falls upon us, rather than retreating into murmuring and complaint, what if we charge forward praising God? Did you also know that you are an ambassador for Melvi Broadcasting Network? What do I mean? By watching and by sharing with your family, with your friends, with your workmates, and others in your network, you help us to reach more people with life-changing messages. So, after watching our videos, remember to like, to share on all your social media platforms and get the word out there. Get your friends and your family to know about this ministry and the Jesus who is about to come. So God bless you as you do that. Amen. We are um, going to continue on our series on righteousness by faith. It's a five-part series. This is the third part. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to do the next one next week or do my testimony for um, for the month that we're in, but we'll, we'll see. Um, but we, um, you know, I, I want to reiterate something I said earlier, and we started the series that you know there's a lot of great and deep, powerful doctrines we as Adventists have, but they don't really matter if you don't get this one. Um, it does us no good to know all of the workings, all of the conspiracies, and um, all that the, the beast is doing and the image of the beast and all this stuff if we don't understand how it is that we are saved. And for a lot of people, they, you can get so caught up in all of that stuff that you miss the real crux of what Christianity is. And... That's what this series is about, kind of going back to basics. So we are going to go to part three, our scripture reading. As was read earlier, it comes from Romans chapter three um, and verse 23, Romans three and verse 23, which says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So our message today is um, Righteousness by Faith, Part 3, Growing in Grace, Growing in Grace. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to study your word. Once again, Lord, I just ask that you make me a nail on the wall and on that nail hang a portrait of Jesus Christ. We need to look into your face today, Lord, for it is by beholding that we become changed. So Father God, let me not be seen or heard. We are, we are in need of a word from your throne room today. Speak, Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit, bind the devil, and cast him far from here, Lord. He is trying to mess with many of us right now, but calm us, Lord, and give us peace. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we're going to go to make the point, we're going to use a great Bible case study of one of the most interesting stories in all the Bible, in my opinion. That is the story of King Manasseh. You go to 2 Chronicles chapter 33, and we're going to start at verse 1. 2 Chronicles chapter 33, starting at verse 1, says this. Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 50 and 5 years in Jerusalem. He is one of the longest reigning kings and one of the kings that starts youngest. Now, he has the, the um, advantage that he would have known uh, well King Hezekiah who was a righteous king. But at 12 years old, Manasseh ascends and takes the throne and begins a very long reign over the kingdom of Judah. Verse 2 begins to tell the, 
the, the story of Manasseh. Verse 2 says, But Manasseh did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, like unto the abominations of the what? Of the heathen, whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. So here is the king of Judah, the leader of God's people. And the Bible starts his story not just with his age and how long he reigns, but with the idea that he took after the heathens. Verse 3, for he built again the high places which Hezekiah his father had broken down, and he reared up altars for Balaam, and made groves, and worshipped all the hosts of heaven, and he served them. So here he is, king of Judah, and this young man, whose father was righteous, he comes in and he begins to set up altars to Balaam. He made groves and worshipped all the host of heaven. He worshipped the sun. He worshipped the moon. He worshipped all of the pagan gods. He brings in to, uh, into the people of God uh, a complete corruption of uh, the worship system. I was listening to Little Light Studios last night. They had um, a guy who came out of acting. He's been in some big things. He played Muhammad Ali in, a in one of the movies. I think it's called... Um, one night in Miami, he, the guy who played Muhammad Ali is, is a Seventh-day Adventist now. Um, and he gives the, his testimony and he talks about how God pulled him out of Hollywood. It's a very, very powerful testimony. Um, it's, he was going home to Ghana. Part of his family is Ghanaian. So he was going to Ghana and he was taking some like uh, courses that you could take an abbreviated course to get a, get a deg uh, degree because, um, you know, in Can where he was in Canada, where he grew up, um, he hadn't gone to college. He'd gone into acting. And so he decided to pick the biggest book to take to Ghana with him to read. And so he, the, on the list of books he could take for the classes was the Bible. So he went home and his mother had one of those family Bibles, you know, the giant family Bibles. And he, he puts that in his backpack to go to Ghana. Can you imagine when he took that out to, to read everywhere he went? But as he read the Bible from cover to cover, he was transformed. You got to, if you, if, you, if, you, if you ask, we can send it out. It's very powerful. What's fascinating is while in Hollywood, he talks about the fact that, and he says, much of what we think doesn't really exist actually absolutely exists in Hollywood. He points out all of the corruption, the paganism, Satan worship. He says one of the interesting things, just speaking to this thing of worshiping all the hosts of heaven, is that one of the senior actors that many of us watch and probably have watched and listened to in our lives when he was in his trailer, this senior actor said to him, I told him that he worships the sun and invited him into the cult of sun worship. And that if he does this, his career will what? Flourish. Ha. Huh. I believe Manasseh thought that if he sided with these pagan gods, he would do better as king. I believe Manasseh hedged his bet and he looked around. The northern kingdom was already in trouble because of Assyria. And he looked around and, and I, think, I think he looked at it and he, and he thought in his mind that he would be better off if he served the gods of the world. Let me tell you something. This is one of Satan's great lies. The gods of this world uh, do not pay the debt they owe you. They sign you up and they give you, uh, and, and they take, your, take your, your value. They take your money, as it were. But they never repay what they are supposed to. So what else does Manasseh do? Verse 4. Also he built altars in the house of the Lord, whereof the Lord had said, In Jerusalem shall be my name, shall my name be forever. So look at this. He then goes into the actual house of God. And builds altars to these gods. Can you imagine? The temple where when Solomon um, had, uh, um, uh, did the um, uh, initiation for the, for, the, for, the, for the temple. And they prayed and fire came down. And, uh, and the presence of God was there. And now they bring in and, and, and create abomination in the house of God by bringing in these altars. And he built altars for all the hosts of heaven in the cor two courts of the house of the Lord. Can you imagine? Now, this is where it gets really sick. I want you to follow this. I want you to see just how dark the life of Manasseh became. Verse 6 says, And he caused his children to pass through the fire in the valley of, of the son of Hinnom, 
Also, he observed times and he used enchantments and used witchcraft and dealt with a familiar spirit and with wizards. He wrought much evil in the sight of the Lord to what? To provoke the Lord to what? To anger. I hope you're getting this. I hope you're getting this. In fact, we live in a time like this. When the world is trying to get you to pass your children through the fire. The world is trying to have you commit. And I'm going to get a little deeper into what it means to pass your children through the fire here in a second. But I want you to see the enchantments, the witchcraft, the familiar spirits, the wizards. He, he wants you to get into this. And isn't it interesting that we live in a time when the fastest growing religion among young Americans is Wicca and witchcraft? When in fact, most of young people don't believe in God, but there are more, probably uh, 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 many of them that believe that you can go to a school called Hogwarts and become a wizard. We live in a time when the church itself has begun to adopt some of these corrupt ideas where yoga and meditation. I went into a church. We, we, went, on, we went on a tour the last three weeks. My wife and I was going to churches and tell me, let me tell you something. Some places we went, we could not believe what we were seeing and hearing. And I, we walked into one, and there's someone sitting there in a, in, a, in a, I don't even do my hands like that, one of them poses in the back of the church, meditating. It has crept into the church again. The Bible says, he wrought much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. Well, it gets even worse. Verse 7, and he said, a carved image, the idol which he had made in the house of God, of which God had said to David and to Solomon, his son, in this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen before all the tribes of Israel, will I put my name forever. Verse 8, neither will I any more remove the foot of Israel from out of the land which I have appointed for your fathers, so that they will take heed to do all that I have commanded them according to the whole law and the statutes and the ordinances by the hand of Moses. So he, God laid it out. Listen, this is what God had said. It was all very clear. Verse 9, so Manasseh made Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to do what? To err. What did... <laughs> What happened when the leadership was not right? The people erred. The whole nation began to go into sin. Look at this. And look at, look at verse 9. I want you, this is real important. And to do worse than the heathen whom the Lord had destroyed before the children of Israel. How incredible is that? So here it is, God wiped out these tribes because of their wickedness. And now under the leadership and guidance of Manasseh, they, the people of God are led to do worse than the heathen did. So if the heathen were wiped out for doing this in their ignorance, what do the people of God deserve in their knowledge? So, is it happening today? Absolutely. There are different gods sometimes. Um, but, you know, we can get caught up in all of these different things. There's a whole rise in nationalism. The, the, you have, you know, there's a, and, and, uh, and, and people clinging to their nations and so forth. And there's, there's money and self and power and all these different things that people can follow and get into. Sometimes it's the, the God you worship does not even seem like a God. You can worship the God of sports if you're not careful. I know folk that know could tell you all the people on all the NCAA basketball teams, all of them. They every and every four years, all the basketball teams change. If you know anything about college football, college sports, they can't tell you the twelve disciples they ain't changed in two thousand years. You can make idols and gods out of almost anything if you're not careful. In fact, there's a good book here. Jonathan Kahn wrote this book, The Return of the Gods. I won't get too into this. I think I talked about it before. But he talks about how some of these gods, Balaam, Ashtaroth, and Moloch, have actually returned, and the spirit in which they have returned. And if you, have, if you want to read a very interesting book, this is one. I don't agree with everything he says, but it is a fascinating book. Because in many ways, the spirit of Balaam, which is to wipe out God, the spirit of Ashtaroth, which is sexual sin, and the spirit of Moloch, which is the destruction of children, all three spirits have, in a sense, really become prominent in Western society just like Manasseh, right? 
So this is a, a good article I read, The True History of Moloch, this ancient god of child sacrifice. Moloch was a horrible god. They would take and put in here, in the bottom of it, they'd heat it up, and then they'd lay kids on the arms here uh, and sacrifice them. I'm going to read you what they say about it. 2 Kings 21, 16, moreover, Manasseh shed innocent blood very much. Look at what Manasseh did. Till he had filled Jerusalem from one end to another, uh, beside his sin wherewith, wherewith he made Judah to sin, in doing that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. Manasseh was so wicked, the Bible says he shed innocent blood so much that Jerusalem was filled with blood from one end to the other. I hope you're getting this. I'm painting a picture. This was one of the most wicked men in all of Scripture, especially that were supposed to be of the house of God. This is actual archaeological evidence of, uh, from the Roman period um, of the worship of Molech here called Tophet. Um, just interesting to show you that the Bible is real. You can, archaeological, you know, we hear that the rocks will cry out, that you can actually find evidence of these things. Here's what one medieval French rabbi, Shlomo Yitzhaki, um, wrote um, back in the 12th century. Tophet is Moloch, and this is what I just showed you of those things from Moloch, which, he was, he was, which was made of brass. And they heated him from his lower parts and his hands being stretched out and made hot. They put the chilled child between his hands and it was burnt. When it vehemently cried out, but the priests beat a drum that the father might not hear the voice of his son and his heart might not be moved. This is what he brought into the house of God. This is what, this is what Manasseh did with his own children. And so you can see, this is, these are some pictures of what that would have looked like. I'm harping on this, but I want to tell you it's, it's happening today. Uh, there is a rise of true, um, uh, the spirit of Moloch, and uh, this is the temple, the satanic temple. I've talked about it before. This is them in the um, Indiana State Capitol. They have created uh, abortion um, religious rights. Um, when I say rights, I mean R-I-T-E-S, our, our religious rights, religious practices, so that they can say, when people say abortion is not legal in the state, they can say, it is my satanic religion. It is a part of my satanic practice that I'm able to do this. The spirit of Moloch. And we see now that this, 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 this thing is coming. This one article, 12 unique ways rappers have portrayed Jesus Christ. And you see all these people coming out, little Nas X just recently came out and offended a lot of people with, these, with this, this imagery. Kanye West, who's uh, clearly not all, all right upstairs sometimes. But, um, you know, this is, this is the age you live in. It is an age of Moloch. It is an age where the, the twisted, the, the vile has become commonplace. And here's why that's relevant. Partly it's relevant because you can get to a place where you think people are beyond where God can save them. It gets so dark, you start to think, it's time to give up. See, I'd have given up on Manasseh. I'm not going to lie. You'd think, you don't even bother with Manasseh. He's too wicked. But here's what the Bible says. Look at this. Prophets of Kings, page 382 says this. Um, speaking of what Manasseh did, one of the first to fall was, was Isaiah, who for over half a century had stood before Judah as the appointed messenger of Jehovah. Others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment, they were stoned and they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with a sword and wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in the dens and caves of the earth. That's Hebrews 11.36, the sister white is quoting. She quotes it because the tradition says that it was Manasseh who took Isaiah, put him in a log and, and cut him asunder, sawn asunder. Can you imagine? He took the prophet of God according to the tradition, put him in a log and then had the log cut in half with him in it. This is how wicked Manasseh was. God does not give up so easily. Second Chronicles 33 and verse 10 says this. And the Lord spake to Manasseh and to his people, but what? But they would not hearken. Even in the darkness of Manasseh's sin, God kept trying to reach him. 
Even as the whole nation began to go into apostasy, God kept trying to call out to them. I want to submit to you today that even right now, God is calling out to this nation. Even right now, he's calling out to this church. He is calling out. He's asking. He's pleading. He's saying, behold, I stand at the door and knock. The Bible says, but they would not hearken. They simply wouldn't listen. They were so caught up in the world. And I mean, you, you know, if I translate it to modern day, they were more caught up in the nightclub and in the latest music being released. In the, in the alcohol, in the, in the new drugs being released. Uh, we're seeing some crazy things today uh, with minds being taken over. Fentanyl has gone rampant in this country and the deaths are so high. And we're watching as the whole nation begins to deteriorate. We've legalized marijuana. I don't know if you guys saw it recently, but there was a woman who, just, um, who, who was high on marijuana and stabbed her boyfriend over a hundred times, killing him, of course. When the police came, she turned the knife on herself and stabbed herself, they said, some 40-something times. And she lived. She, they said the first time, she stabbed herself in the neck. Here's how, it gets, here's how crazy it gets. When it came time for them to, um, for them to um, sentence her, they sentenced her to 100 days of community service. Can you believe that? Because they said she didn't really do it. She was in a marijuana-induced psychosis. That's the world we live in, church. So, we go to 2 Chronicles chapter 33 and verse 11. Wherefore the Lord brought upon them, so they wouldn't listen, so here's what God does. Wherefore the Lord brought upon them the captains of the host of the king of Assyria, which took Manasseh among the thorns and bound him with fetters and carried him to Babylon. And you see a, a a, a picture of, of what that would have looked like. They would, act, they, they, they would take and put in the nose of their captives and walk them kind of by the nose all the way back. They wouldn't listen when God pleaded to them. So God, the Bible says, the Lord brought upon them the captains of the host of the king of Assyria. What, and here's what happens. When you reject God, when you say, I don't want God in my life, you know what God is? God is a gentleman. He says, okay, I'll step back. And when God steps back, what happens? The Assyrians come in. The enemy comes in. And God allows that to happen because that's literally what you asked for. 2 Chronicles 33 and verse 12. This is where the story gets almost fascinating. Look at this. 2 Chronicles verse 33. Verse 12. This is the same Manasseh. And when he was in affliction... He besought the Lord his God, look at this, and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers and prayed unto him and he was entreated of him and heard his supplication and brought him again to Jerusalem into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord, he was God. Now that's just two verses. Seems real simple. But if you really step back, there's a lot that must have happened for these two verses to be written. He had to have been taken to a horrible place in Babylon. He was probably treated like an animal. He was probably starved. He was probably beaten. He was probably spoken to horribly. He was probably uh, 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 subjected to all kinds of torture and punishment. Uh, if nothing else, he would have had to act uh, uh, like a very common prisoner of war. But in his affliction, the Bible says, Manasseh, who had all his life, since he was 12 years old, all his life he had sought the enemy. All his life he had worshipped false gods. All his life he had taken even his own children and sacrificed them to Moloch. When he was in trouble, isn't it interesting? Manasseh turned to God. The Bible says he humbled himself. And the Bible doesn't just say he humbled himself. He says, it says he humbled himself greatly. And prayed unto him, and he was entreated of him, and he heard his supplication and brought him again unto Jerusalem, into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord, he was God. God listened to Manasseh's prayer, freed him from whatever captivity he was in. The Bible doesn't even tell us how that happens. 
He frees him from that captivity, brings him back to Jerusalem, puts him back on the throne. And as Manasseh goes through that, can you imagine the walk back from Babylon to Jerusalem? Can you imagine how, what Manasseh must have been thinking as he's traveling back, as his mind wanders to all the ways he had violated God? But this is why God allows affliction. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 19 says, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Job 23 and verse 10 says this, But he knows the way that I take. When he has tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Ha! So remember, we're talking about growing in grace. We've talked about justification before. Justification is the substitution. It is God taking, uh, Christ taking our place. We, right now, have the opportunity to live the life that Christ deserves because he died the death we deserve. Justification. He's our substitute. He took our place. That is the beauty of Christianity. But once you have come to know who Jesus is and you, by faith you believe in him, there's another step that has to happen. You are called then to grow in grace. And one of the things God uses for you to grow in grace is trial and difficulty. In fact, one of the reasons the wicked sometimes seem to prosper, right? Sometimes it seems the wicked prosper is because God is not, they are, they are not asking God to work on their character like we are. And because we pray, Lord, help me to be a better Christian. Lord, help me to uh, live the life you have me to live. Lord, help me to walk with you. God says, yes, I'm going to help you. But that will mean you're going to have to go through some hard times sometimes. Uh, some of you are going through something right now. You're going through difficulty right now. You're going through challenge right now. And I came today to tell you, God is looking to grow your grace. He's looking to build you up. This is, uh, we're going to talk more about sanctification, but this is him moving you from the stage of justification into the process of sanctification. He is looking to develop something in you. Uh, and, and when you look at it in Romans, um, in Romans chapter 5, this is supposed to be Romans, not Revelation. Romans chapter 5, it says this, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 5 says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The question I have for you as a Christian, do you have peace? We're justified by what? By faith. It's faith that allows us to accept that Christ is our substitute. Verse 2, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory. Look at what we glory in church. We glory in what? Tribulations also, knowing that tri tribulation worketh what? Patience. That's powerful. Tribulation worketh patience. You know what Revelation 14, 12 says? Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. It's tribulation that helps you to do it. It's going through these trials, learning that you can trust God. That's what grows it. Verse 3, and not only so, we, but we glory in tribulations, also knowing that the tribulation works with patience. Romans 5 again, and patience works experience, and experience what? Hope. As you go through trial, Romans 5 tells us, as you go through trial, what happens is your patience becomes experience. It actually develops character. And as you have these experiences of God taking you through the storm, God taking you through the difficulty, as you do that, your experience breeds something called hope. And look at verse 5. Romans 5, 5 says, and hope makes not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Hope makes us what? Not ashamed. Let me tell you something. If you read that Seventh-day Adventist Bible commentary on this, it says something profound. It says that, that when you look at the verse that talks about peace, therefore being justified by faith, Romans, Romans 5, 1, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, it says, right? The STA Bible commentary says that this means we, you, it's not that you're just simply forgiven for your sin. 
Because if you were just forgiven of your sin, it would not bring you in peace because of the consequences of your sin. You would still, it's like someone who's gotten, gotten a sentence, a sponge, like that lady I was telling you about. If she's ever in her right mind, the fact that she was acquitted, basically, and only got 100 hours of community service would not remove the guilt of what she did. I hope you all getting this. The fact that you get off in court does not mean you're going to feel better about what you did. But when it comes to sin, that's what happens. You see, because what God does is he takes your sin and he removes it. And the Bible says he takes our sin and he casts it into the sea of forgetfulness. In fact, when we stand before God, we stand before him as if we had never sinned. And unless you get that, you will never have peace as a Christian. You've got to understand that the blood of Jesus Christ, it still washes, it still cleanses, it works a complete renewal in you so that you are a new creature in Christ Jesus. That means I have peace with God because I don't stand in front of God worried about what I did. I stand in front of God joyful for what he did. It's in Chronicles 33, verse 12. The Bible says, and when he was in affliction, Manasseh besought the Lord as God. Isn't that interesting? God never stopped being Manasseh's God. Manasseh chose to reject God as his God. He prayed and God came for him. Look at, so we're going to look at grace and mercy. I want to look at it. We use those words a lot. The Greek word for mercy is most often elios, which is pity or compassion. And for grace is cherish or favor. Mercy and grace is paraphrased from Wilmington's Guide to the Bible can be differentiated as follows. Mercy is the act of withholding deserved punishment. Did y'all get that? Mercy is withholding of deserved punishment, while grace is the act of endowing unmerited favor. You get the difference? It's not the same thing. Mercy says you sinned the wages of sin is death. Mercy says eternal death, uh, I mean, the law says eternal death is what you're supposed to get. Mercy says you sinned, but you're not going to get death. Because grace says that the gift of God is eternal life. So although you don't deserve eternal life, grace endows you with favor you did not deserve. This is, again... This is Christianity 101. I'm a Christian because unlike every other religion in the world, I don't have to save myself. I don't have to flog myself with whips and climb up steps on glass, right? I don't have to say so many Hail Marys or, 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 or do any of this stuff. I, 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 there's no way for me to figure out to save myself. I can't be reincarnated and come back as a slug and then do be a good slug. and then become, I don't even know how it all works, but I don't want to be a slug. None of it works. What the, what the Bible teaches, what Christianity in, is in its essence, is an opportunity for you to plug in to something greater than yourself, for you to plug in to the only source of righteousness in the universe. You get to plug into Christ, and he lived a sinless life. And when you stand before God, it is as if you lived that life. And when he died on the cross, it's as if he lived your sinful life. He was made sin. That's the beauty of Christianity, church. There's nothing in the world like it. There's no reason to raise a sword and conquer the world violently. There's no reason to trick people, no reason to, to work magic. It's simple. God has made a way for you already. In his mercy, God does not give us the punishment we deserve, namely eternal death, the second death. While in his grace, God gives us the gift we do not deserve, namely eternal life with God in heaven. Why is that song that Sister Laura sang earlier so important? Because when you're going through trial, you've got to stop and focus on this. When life gets difficult, pause for a second and think about what Jesus did on the cross. Think about how much he suffered. Think about what he went through. Think about what he did paid for you so that you would have an opportunity at life eternal. 
And yeah, this world is difficult, but that tribulation works patience. That patience works experience. That experience works hope. And we are transformed. Our characters develop. And as our characters are developed, we become more like Christ. The secret to gaining victory over sin, I'll say it again, is not to look at your past. It's not to look at your failures. It's not to look at who you were. It's not to look at how broken you are. The secret to victory over sin, the secret to being a Christian, is to look at Jesus. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. By beholding, you become changed. That's why the devil wants you looking at everything else. He wants you looking at Netflix and he wants you looking at all this foolishness because the more you look at that, the less like Christ you become. He wants you looking at your failures. He wants you looking at your past. He wants you looking at yourself. He wants you looking at everything. He wants you to look everywhere but to Jesus. Romans 3. 23 and 24 again, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Verse 24, but being, we being justified freely by what? By his grace. We are justified freely through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Look what the SDA Bible commentary says on this. Men have lived in hatred and rebellion against God. This is on Romans 3, 24 in SDA Bible commentary have perverted his truth, have preferred to worship beasts and reptiles, have defiled his image in their own bodies, have blasphemed his name, and have despised God for his patience and forbearance. Finally, they murdered his son, sent to save them. Yet through it all, God has continued to regard man with love and kindness that the revelation of his goodness may lead men to what? Isn't that crazy? Almost the worse you become, the more he comes after you. Where sin does abound, grace does what? Much more abound. No matter how bad you get, you, yeah, I say it all the time, you have not out God's ability to save you. This is the grace of God in its peculiar New Testament sense. It is not merely God's favor toward those who might merit his approval. It is unlimited, all-inclusive, transforming love toward sinful men and women. And the good news of this grace, as revealed in Jesus Christ, is the power of God unto salvation. It is not merely God's mercy and willingness to forgive. Watch this. It is an active, energizing, transforming power to save. God does not simply save you uh, 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 from your sin. He saves you from sinning going forward. This is where a lot of Christians get tripped up. I'll say it again. The mango tree does not grow mangoes to prove it's a mango tree. The mango tree grows mangoes because it's a mango tree. The Christian does not do good works to prove, he, prove he's a Christian. The Christian does good works because he is a Christian. The commentary goes on to say this. Thus it may fill a person. This is grace. It may fill a person. It may be given. It is all sufficient. It reigns. It teaches. It establishes the heart. In some instances, grace seems almost to be equivalent to gospel and to the working of God generally. Divine grace, as Ellen White, she says, divine grace is the great element of saving power. Christ gave his life to make it possible for man to be restored to the image of God. It is the power of his grace that draws men together in obedience to the truth. You cannot glorify God and live in rebellion against him. You know what they do in churches now? They call worship a service, right? And what I mean by that is they say, well, I should say praise a service. So they say, we're going to have a praise service. And so you set up a band and you play the music and we sing the songs, sometimes seven words, 11 times, over and over again, right? 7-11. And you go up and you sing and you sing and you sing and say, we are praising God. No, you're not. The demons can sing up there with you. We praise God by how we live when nobody's looking. Anybody can go up on stage and sing. Prophets and Kings, page 382. But this repentance, remar this, is, this is speaking of Manasseh again. But this repentance, remarkable though it was, came too late to save the kingdom from the corrupting influence of years of idolatrous practices. 
Many had stumbled and fallen, never again to rise. Isn't that fascinating? Manasseh messed up so bad. He's taken captive. He comes back. But when he comes back and tries to reestablish things, for many people, it is too late. Let me say this, especially to the parents. Do not be Manasseh. For many of us as parents, we, we, we may not live right, and then we finally get it together, and then we come back, and, and it's too late. If you have children, especially young children, make sure that you are in, instilling in them now the principles of God. Prophets and Kings, page 387.2 says, we must cherish, cherish and cultivate the faith of which prophets and apostles have testified. The faith that lays hold on on the promises of God and waits for deliverance in his appointed time and way. The sure word of prophecy will meet its final fulfillment in the glorious advent of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As King of kings and Lord of lords, the time of waiting may seem long. The soul may be oppressed by discouraging circumstances. Many in whom confidence has been placed may fall by the way. But with the prophet who endeavored to encourage Judah in a time of unparalleled apostasy, let us confidently declare, the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. Habakkuk 2.20. Let us ever hold in remembrance the cheering message. Here's the cheering message, church. The vision is yet for an appointed time. But at the end, it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it it will surely come. It will not tarry. The just shall live by what? Live by his faith. This, This speaks to two things. One of them is the fact that we must stay with God long enough for the full transformation to come. Here's the patience of the saints. The Bible says a just man falls seven times. What does he do? He rises every time. He is not made unjust because he fell. He would be made unjust if he didn't get up and keep moving towards God. I hope you're getting this. You, your failure isn't your fall. Your failure is your, is your inability or your lack of desire to return to God. And that's why it says here, listen, uh, 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 it's going to come. You just got to keep moving towards God. He's got to work on you. And the other thing that's coming for sure is his soon second coming. Jesus is about to return, church. It may seem like it's taking forever, but as you look at the news, as you look at what's happening in the world, the serial killers they uncover, the mass shootings, the, the war in the world, the famine in the world, uh, the, there are countries that have devolved into complete chaos in the world right now. It doesn't even make the news. Violence is in the land. It's not going to be much longer before Jesus says enough is enough. And he puts this world on pause and he returns. And there are two things he's waiting for to come. Number one, the Bible says, and this gospel shall be preached in all the world for a witness, and then shall the end come. And church, that is going further faster than many of us realize. But the other one is that he is returning for a church without spot or blemish. It is the character of the church. We should have the character of Christ. We must grow in grace every day looking to see how, every day contemplating his word. I I tell you all the time, walk around with index cards, with Bible promises. When the day gets hard, reflect on the Bible promise. Use God's word. It is his word in conjunction with the Holy Spirit that causes us to grow in grace. Grace being the power to save, to transform us. The Holy Spirit working in us. So what ended up happening with Manasseh? Well, 2 Chronicles 33 and verse 14 says, Now after this he built a wall without the city of David on the west side of Gihon in the valley even to the entering in at the fish gate and compassed about Ophel and raised it up a very great height and put captains of war in all fenced cities of Judah. Which tells you Manasseh trusted so much in these pagan gods he didn't think he needed to defend his country. When he gets back he starts to build up defenses. He realizes second that he had to remove The strange gods, 15, and he took away the strange gods and the idol out of the house of the Lord and all the altars that he had built in the mount of the house of the Lord and in Jerusalem, he cast them out of the city. You see what he does? He comes back, he starts cleaning up shop. Verse 16, and he repaired the altar of the Lord and sacrificed thereon peace offerings and thanks offerings and commanded Judah to serve the Lord God of Israel. 
So he, he commanded them. Nevertheless, the people did sacrifice still in the high places, yet under the Lord their God only. And what did that do? That left space for the heathen practices to return. You got to be careful trying to worship God on the devil's platform. Now the rest of the acts of Manasseh and his prayer unto his God and the words of the seers that spake to him in the name of the Lord God of Israel. Behold, they are written in the book of the kings of Israel. His prayer also and how God was entreated of him and all his sins and his trespasses and the places where he built high places and set up groves and graven images before he was humbled. Behold, they are written among the sayings of the seers. So Manasseh slept with his fathers and they buried him in his own house. And Ammon, his son, reigned in his stead. Manasseh lived one of the most terrible lives. But to show you the power of God's grace, Manasseh died saved. And let me say that if Manasseh could be saved, there's hope for all of us. And that's what I want you to take from this. That is grace. We grow in grace as we accept that Christ has done enough. I say, I, I, one of the things I like to say is that people, you know, they, 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 take their, um, they take your clothes and you put it in the washing machine. Put in the Tide and the Clorox or whatever. You walk away and you don't even think about it anymore, do you? There are folk who have more faith in Tide and Clorox than they do in the blood of Jesus Christ. The blood of Jesus still washes. It still cleanses. It's still working on the hearts and lives of men. The question for you today is, will you allow his blood to be applied to your life? Matthew 16 and verse 25 says it like this. For whosoever sh will save his life shall lose it. Whosoever will lose his life for my sake, Jesus says, shall find it. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. I can tell you that we live in a time when people think that what this world has to offer is what's most important. I was talking to somebody recently who was going through some difficult times, going through some troubles, family issues, marital issues. And they've worked so hard to build an empire for themselves. They have so much, they've worked so hard. This person began to weep and cry as they talked about what they were now about to lose. And I... I, and I <laughs> And I was trying to navigate this and talk about reconciliation in the marriage and other things. But as I, as I sat and I stopped and I listened, God kept telling me this is, this is not a legal issue. This is a spiritual one. You see, if, you, if you're willing to fight to save money in a divorce, why aren't you willing to fight to save your soul? Why is it that people will spend fortunes on attorneys to protect themselves against earthly laws, but the free gift of God through grace, they reject outright? I came to tell you today, what is a man profited if he gained the world and lose his soul? And what would a man give in exchange for his soul? Grace says God will take your mess and give you beauty. Why won't you accept that? Why don't you understand what God is doing for you even now? The work that he's committed to in your life. Jesus is about to return. This year is one of the silly years. This is a presidential election year. You're going to see people going crazy over two candidates, two rather interesting candidates in my opinion. But we ought not be distracted. It doesn't matter who they elect to be president of the United States. They can't fix this world's problems. Only Jesus can do that. And I am telling you that he must win your heart. Moment by moment, day by day, he must win your heart. And once you do that, grace will grow. 
and you will be transformed. God isn't looking to punish you. He's looking to save you. All you got to do is accept it. If you want to accept that free gift of grace that is in Jesus Christ, I just ask you to stand with me as we pray. As every head is bowed and every eye is closed, Father God, we thank you for the gift of grace. It is unmerited favor. We cannot deserve what you've done for us. We cannot earn what you've done for us. And we don't deserve what you did for us. But Father God, it speaks to your love for us, your character. Father God, now I pray for us as a church here at Three Angels in Newington, Connecticut. I pray for our churches globally that there would be a return to primitive godliness. Father God, we would go back to just the basics and remember who Jesus is. And as we walk in relationship with you, as we find the peace that we spoke of in Romans 5 and verse 1, when we find that peace, Lord, we want to live lives that would not disrupt that peace because Jesus is our friend and Savior. I ask a blessing on everyone here today, Lord. Lord, we would follow you wherever you lead us. And Lord, if Manasseh, with all of the wickedness he did, could be humbled greatly and turn back to you, Lord, there's not one of us that has an excuse. Help us to follow you no matter what and wherever you lead is our prayer in Jesus' name. Let the church say amen and amen. Remain still. Melvi Broadcasting Network, a divine voice out of Africa. Remember to like, to subscribe, and to click the bell.